Good evening and welcome to another edition of uh, Life is People. Well, I'm most on a friend of mine and it's, it's been good to catch up for us all this time. So, I'm doing great, really. I mean, considering we're back into a COVID lockdown, uh, I, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to the end of January where here in the United States, we'll start to pull out of the peak of Gomicron. Yeah, which is, again, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fascinating one. I remember I was able to touch on that with you because it's hard, and I know you sort of, you sort of dwell on it a few times, but when you can, re when you listen to the mass media that's pumped you, they, they tend to, for many reasons, and the clickbait and etc. but they tend to focus on a lot of the negative and the fear. But I have recently read with Omicron that almost a way of looking at it is, it's almost nature's uh, kind of own, um, how can you say, it? own solution to its own problem. It's a weaker version, so everybody gets it, so then we become immune to it. Well, you know, so I, I, there's some good news with... As yes, I, I, I know this program is not about viruses, but just to make everybody feel better, the, the virus is motivated in the same way all living organisms are. It wants to live. And it doesn't get to live if it keeps killing its host. So yeah. the way that viruses react in nature normally uh, is that they get less and less and less fatal. Yeah. So they may start out, they're killing their host, but they learn very quickly and they're adaptive. All living organisms are adaptive and their primary purpose is to survive. So in order to survive, what this virus has done is it's made itself more contagious so that it has more hosts and less deadly. And that is really how viruses function in the natural world. Now, we don't know because we don't have enough information from China whether this is completely natural or not natural. And it was acting in an unnatural way um, because it was gaining strength and it was becoming more fatal for a short period of time. But as a, a biologist myself, I, I wasn't that concerned about the short range. You know, it's very hard to make any determination about adaptation physiological adaptation in in small windows like three months or six months so uh i reserved the right to just watch this virus and see if it took a more natural course which it has so to me omicron is a good sign more contagion less lethal is a real good sign that this is going to go the way that other viruses in the natural world go well perfect that's that's, that's one great way of uh uplifting people, you know, you know, people's spirits. And just before we went live, you sort of, you, we, we were discussing about, uh, which is really want to make the theme of this conversation really, was about creativity and the future of AI or artificial intelligence, which I, I like to call it artificial intelligence because I think it's more a very, it gives you a very plain view of it rather than that AI, which people could, because of the movies they've seen, they can start to imagine so many, you know, nightmare scenarios. But with creativity and artificial intelligence, um, to my, contemplating my thought process being, I'm, I'm essentially before we went live, that we're at a point now where we've had a lot of human history has been dedicated to the arts, music, painting, all, all sorts of arts. And in the last few years particularly, we've seen artificial intelligence just race ahead. I mean, you can go now and watch, go, go onto your computer and you can watch you can literally just type in a phrase and, the, and the, the AI or the artificial intelligence will paint on the screen for you in whatever words you put in, which is it's incredible. We've, you've got this machine throughout, you know, throughout algorithms is, is doing that. Then you start to proceed ahead and you think, OK, is, is, is the end point of this where the machine, like it did in chess, you know, Casper thought it was the best and then, then came deep blue and wiped out, you know. Does it mean that in the future that the, the things we've got right now, the musicians and the artists and people like that, are they almost redundant in the future? Well, you know, I, I don't have that dread <laughs> um, for a number of reasons. So you have to separate creativity and that's what's going to happen, right? Because what artificial intelligence is good at is it's finding patterns that we didn't know exist. So creativity that's based on pattern, you know, what uh, people find attractive. Um, you know, there was, uh, when the book, The Da Vinci Code came out, 
people got a little freaked out because there are certain mathematical proportions in uh, paintings, as an example, or architecture that lend themselves to what we as human beings interpret as beautiful, as balanced, right? And so uh, AI is able to find those things that we find appealing, uh, attractive. Um, we can even take a person's face, right? We take 500 supermodels and we find that there are uh, patterns in proportion of their nose, their eyes, their eyebrows, their lips, the size of their lips, and that there are certain proportions that we as human beings find attractive and certain proportions we find not very attractive, right? So when you talk about creativity, you have to talk about, is it pattern based, right? Is there some mathematical proportion or are there certain types of brush strokes or a combination of brush strokes in a painting that we tend to gravitate toward and put high values on? Uh, and are there others that we find disagreeable and, uh, and we put a lower value on? So what AI will do is it will look for those patterns, but there's a big difference between pattern and inventiveness, right? And so where AI can help us is somebody who steps out of the box right uh you know uh, it, it could be uh somebody who decides they're going to drip paint all over a canvas and create uh layers and layers and layers of of abstract imagery and movement and ai looks at that and says um i don't know what the pattern is mm. i don't know I, I i don't know uh if there's a mathematical proportion here or whatever i'll look for it i'll certainly analyze it and look for it but it may not exist now. But then later, uh, following Jackson Pollock's work, great work and revolutionary work, there may be other abstract painters who use that formulation, use that style and, and uh, you know, build on it, if you will. And over time, the AI computer may find a pattern in that genre of painting, that style of painting. So we have to distinguish inventiveness that the AI can find no pattern to uh, against patterns and proportions and styles, that there is a, a some underlying pattern or redundancy to. Uh, and I, so I think we have to separate those two things. I still wanna add one more thing, if I could. Ed Wilson, who recently passed away, the greatest, uh, arguably the greatest naturalist in the world, he and I were having a conversation one time that really um, made me feel good about being a human being. Because there's a lot of reasons not to feel good about being part of our species. We're not behaving well in modern times. I think most people that are watching your podcast would agree with that. We, 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 we aren't behaving well relative to climate change. We aren't behaving well in terms of being good stewards of wildlife and and uh, other species where we you know we're we're just we're kind of going through this adolescence where we're we're not behaving well one of the things that um he said to me was he said well it's very interesting that we see these movies about space aliens coming and visiting us and uh what you know and and uh hollywood's very good at fantasizing what that will be like they'll try to annihilate us, they'll try to eat us like we eat cattle. You know, they, the, the imagination for, in the science fiction genre is, it goes wild. But he said, you know, they won't be very interested in our technology. <laughs> they, and they actually won't be very interested in our mathematics either, because the further we go out into the universe, we're finding that the laws of physics and mathematics are pretty consistent. They're consistent the further and further we reach out into the universe. And so they'll already have that. They'll already know that. And if they can come to the earth, they pretty much have gone beyond our technology. So the mechanics of our technology, the fact that we have mathematics and language, it's not gonna be that interesting. They have that too. And, and but what is going to be fascinating to other life forms about us is what makes us human, yeah. is what makes us unique. 
they will not have our art. They will not have our music. They will not have our poetry, the way that we use language to express emotion and feelings. These are the things that are uniquely human. It is not likely that another life form, you know, billions and trillions of miles away, and we will eventually find it. We probably, it'll be single celled organisms or something and we'll be very excited. As a biologist, I'd be very excited. Find me a single celled organism that's alive somewhere else. But there will be advanced uh, species as we, as we uh, explore further into the universe. But the, but the fact is they will not have the same creativity as human beings. Mm. And so while it is typical of people in my profession that are scientists and technologists to kind of push the arts aside and say that's something different, it's really not. It's, it's actually the best of who we are as a species. It's the, it's the most unique thing that we have to offer all life forms in the entire universe. Yeah. Because it won't be the map. It won't be the technology. It won't be uh, the Tesla electric car. It won't be the internet. <laughs> you know, the, I don't believe that that will be what we have to offer the universe at large. No, I mean, uh, you're absolutely, I mean, I, there's so many things I can co with you there, Rebecca, on, because I think one of the things that, again, you can look at it from the side of maybe where a lover sort of, the branch of science and, and you know non knowledge and technology is going to go with genetics and you could think okay you could see a time and it's been written about in many novels about the time in the future when we can literally choose what genes are going to turn off certain things we can literally wipe we almost become gods amongst men we can wipe away a lot of the disease and all those kind of things but if you were to in the future even with genetics and you wanted to produce a, a Van Gogh or a Matisse or a Rachmaninoff or whoever it may be in whatever field, you it would be a very, I don't know, it almost be a very difficult decision for a parent to make because the people that I'm talking about, we can, they're, they're countless through history, they've got flaws that you would think from a very, if you looked at it on a, you know, from a, a, a knowledge point of view, well, actually, I don't know if I want my son being, my daughter being neurotic so much, they, they don't want to exit and they all they do is paint yellow or I don't want to, because these are the, what would be deemed as flaws, but like you said, that's the uniqueness of us as what we projected forward. The, 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 the ape can't do that. The, 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 you know, the, the ant doesn't sit around creating art and projecting itself into the future. It's something we've got, but that's built on an inherent, like you said, a lot of it, It's unique to our species, for sure. You, you, you don't see ants uh, creating art just for their pleasure. Now, they do create art. Uh, if you look inside an ant hill and how the ant functions, I could argue that that's living art, right? And if you ever looked at a wasp nest, you know, uh, uh, I, I live in the, on the coast of Oregon, and one of the things I discovered is the wasps here build nests that are four times the size of my head. <laughs> and they are they are structurally amazing. Uh, in fact, uh, the first wasp nest I spotted, the wasp had engineered a hook around my gutter system to secure the, this mass. And, and, and I watched them build it and I would not let my gardener garden anywhere nearby, I, and, nor would I let anyone take it down. <laughs> <laughs> because I, 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 because in terms of a sculpture, it was magnificent, right? Um, but they're not doing it for their pleasure. They're not doing it because they were moved by a feeling, right? They saw something that they needed to express to others and share with others. They're not moved by that. They're, do, they're performing a biological function that happens to create art. In, in nature and as you know art exists everywhere in nature um so but unique to our species is this desire to derive pleasure from music right and to and to construct these notes and these sounds and instruments that will make these sounds and then join the instruments together in orchestras and and you know when you when you really think about opera and, and music and painting and 
poetry and all of these things you you think wow this these make humans so unique and unique in everywhere not just on this planet uh that is what we will have to offer so i don't worry too much about ai finding patterns yes today uh a, a, an ai system can create a pretty good uh song right it it can extract the words that we're drawn to like love need you know close to you uh, it grabs all these words of the favorite songs that we've ever had the most listened to songs and then it compiles it knows what a noun is and a verb and it'll compile a fantastic song for us and it will look at the notes and the arrangement of notes and and, and, and all of that but again it's it can only repeat patterns yes it it cannot invent it can only look for patterns and those patterns may be very attractive to us and there's a chance that a good portion of art may move to pattern based art right that's okay but as you point out there will always be a jackson pollock right there will always be some child who only wants to paint in yellow yeah and you think what you know what is going on with my child and then i say it's unique it's unique and computers can don't do well on one offs mm. there's no pattern on a one off mm. right it it's it's all the followers after that create the pattern but not the inventor itself see it again this is this is one of those things that it's absolutely when you, when you, it's very humbling when you think about it because like you like you spoke to I me mean, again I'm, on the verge and it's, it's, as you say it's really one of the things that you've always spoken about we are this very unique very like you said small thing about being a human which the more you sort of expect, look outwards you think it's so unique you know we, the, like you said this the wasp can make an, an architecture and stuff but this this form of feeling expression like what what does touch you and say i don't know but bb king plays the, the guitar there was something about that man playing that guitar or you know that's that's you you know you, you don't see that in other animals or other things so it's a very it, it makes you kind of very humble to think wow we, we've got this meat machine on us but we're we're such a, a i don't know not special but we're such a a unique form of, of this meat machine that we've got this well we, we are uh you know when you look at the evolution of humankind right uh we are the species who shouldn't have made it i mean there was a period of time in the earth's history where there were only a few thousand of us walking the entire planet our numbers got down so low that we we were the top of the list for extinction right and and out of those low numbers we have climbed to the top of the living pyramid right but many of us today think that we did that because of our mathematics and our technology and and our monetary systems and economy and advanced civilizations and and we we ascribe a lot of it to these external devices but in fact what it, it what it really boils down to is this space suit the, the evolution of the biological space suit we're all trapped in this space suit adapted uh more completely and quicker than any other species we've ever witnessed and it, and and when so you when you use the word unique and special yes we're a very special species and well we're saving well we're saving right because it'll be very interesting to see how humans continue to adapt you mentioned earlier parents being concerned about their child being autistic or or uh behaving in a strange way or or feeling troubled or or all of this and and i as a sociobiologist that kind of has a high profile i get a lot of mail from people who say my child is autistic and they want to put him on drugs and i'm not really sure if that's the best thing and i always have a very difficult time responding to them because it is not clear how humanity is evolving 
right? We, we don't know if autism, as an example, a child who can't really communicate, doesn't like loud sounds, really is very withdrawn, right? Um, and, and doesn't have, you know, social skills and so on and so forth, but can paint like, you know, beautiful paintings or is a mathematical wizard or is a uh, musical savant. Um, uh, people want to normalize that behavior. And yet that behavior may be a response to a very, very uh, overwhelming environment. It may be that those are the survivors in the future, those who can tune out all of this noise and focus deeply on one thing at a time. That may be a huge survival advantage. And so as we see these autism numbers go up and up and up, it's not clear to me that that isn't an adaptation to a social environment that's too overwhelming, right? And too distracting. And, and so I, I'm very troubled. I can't really answer that I, because I don't know how humans will adapt in the future. Our, what, what I do know is we are adapting. Our brains are adapting, our, our appendages are adapting, our entire biological spacesuit that we're all trapped in are constantly adapting to the environment. And so when you see trends like a, a high a growth in autism, or you see people not wanting to have children, right? And, and that birth rates are going down. Those may be adaptive responses to the environment. Yeah. And, and in the same way, when we talk about AI, people get nervous. They get worried. Like machines are gonna take over. Computers are gonna take over. Robots are gonna go take over. This biological spacesuit has a fear response to artificial intelligence. We fear it, right? But it's because we fear what we don't understand. For millions of years, if we encountered something we'd never seen before and didn't understand, our first response, our sympathetic nervous system says, run or fight it. Mm. That's what we know, run or fight. Now along comes these computers that are smarter than us, faster than us, more capable. Robots that can lift a whole house, <laughs> right? And, and we have fear, we have a fear response, but remember that that's a prehistoric response to something we don't understand. Yeah. And, and so what I would say is, AI isn't going to take over the world. Robots aren't going to turn on us and destroy humanity. You know, the, the, the movies are very interesting and everything, but the reality, as a technologist and a scientist, I can say the reality is that won't happen because, because, and here's the reason why, because it would not be in AI's interest to destroy humans. It would not be in a robot's interest to destroy humans. It never will be, right? And and so for that reason, unless humans, pro, you know, some uh, maniacal James Bond, de you know, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, character gets a hold of all AI programming or something, I don't know, you know, they'll come up with some uh, 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 scary movie again. But uh, I, 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 would, I would put everyone at rest. Art is not going away. Music is not going away. It can never go away because it makes us uniquely human. We should not be afraid of AI. It's only able to find patterns and reproduce those patterns, but it cannot invent. Yeah. I mean, this, this is the other side that I often contemplate on. The, the other side of this very nebula sort of discussion point is I think, okay, maybe not the, I, I, can, I can quite, can cope you completely about the fear. I don't fear robots take it over. But there is another thought process when you start to open your mind up and think, okay, well, what do we do when, when everything is done for us? That, you know, that you, I mean, I'm sure you, you must you must be aware of the, <coughs> the mouse utopia experiment, uh, experiment where they put mouse and you know, before you know it, they don't, they don't want to reproduce it, they sat around it. And that's, that's another element that maybe that's where, we, you know, in the future, it's not the fear of the robots taking over. It's like, 
what what are we going to do? It's going to become mushy sitting back, not doing anything. Because you know, okay, so you and I are closer to the same age. So I I remember, and you probably remember this, uh, in the '60s and '70s, maybe it was the '60s or so. Uh, sociologists started writing about the leisure society. Yeah. Right, the '50s and '60s. They said, "My God." Washing machines, dishwashers, car, everyone will own a car for transportation. Uh, your, you, you know, your food can be delivered to you. I mean, what are humans going to do with all their leisure time? Yeah. Right. And and so you can go back and check this. Anybody that's watching this program, just type in the Leisure Society, and you'll see all of the scientific research that sociologists and psychologists were very concerned with people. You know, not having to do anything because everything was going to be automated. Vacuum cleaners that would run themselves. You know, I, I mean, and 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 yet, and yet, the exact opposite happened. Mm -hmm. Today, human beings have less leisure time to themselves, less time to contemplate their existence, think about their own happiness, the happiness of their children. They have less alone. Uh, non-productive time than in any other time in human history yeah we have all this automation even self-driving cars are coming right yeah. uh, we have all everything's automated we don't have to haul our laundry down to the river and beat it on a rock and take a whole day to wash a shirt we don't have that anymore and yet we have less time than ever before so this idea of what are human beings going to do with all that spare time? Uh, I, I wish, I <laughs> wish we had more leisure time because we have found that the number one prerequisite for spirituality, for being in touch with who we are, what we are, is time to contemplate yes you need open time and and if you don't have that it's surely not going to happen if you're constantly doing you, uh, as my friend calls us instead of a human being you're a human doing mm -hmm. right then you're not thinking about being a being and and what it means and uh, to be you and why you matter, and what your gifts and your contribution, right, to reality is. That takes time. And so this is why the most spiritual people, the people that we would consider most spiritual, are monks up in the Himalayas that sit and meditate and contemplate for hours upon hours. Can you even imagine in modern society a mom or a dad with a couple of kids, each working, right? Trying to get the kids uh, homeschooled or off to sports, uh, you know, medical appointments, pick up dry cleaning, get the groceries, all the things that we, we crowd our lives with. Can you even imagine having like two or three hours to contemplate your existence a day? We don't, some, I know moms that are happy to get in the car to drive somewhere to get 15 minutes of quiet. So, so I'm not worried about this, you know, what are we going to do with all of this extra time now that AI and robots and uh, because the more automation, historically, the more automation, the more convenience we have, the more we pack in. No. That's been our trend. Yeah, and you're right, Rebecca. I mean, one of the things I noticed through lockdown in this part, of the particular part of the world, was, and I, I found it quite, quite disconcerting at times. I thought, okay, for whatever reason, and I'm not going to get that discussion, but we've all been locked down, but people didn't take the time to go and walk in nature. They, they would spend the time looking at phones. I'm like, you've got the opportunity now to go out and. You know, those things have been taken away. No one's, you know, you have to be up at half past five in the morning, get on that car, drive an hour to your office, to sit in an office. That's all been taken away. You can appreciate the, the birds singing, go and look at some insects because 
that, that, that contemplation isn't sometimes sitting on a mountain going on. Oh, it's getting the humility from what's around you in nature. And nature goes back to being an artist. Na nature's one of the most humbling, but yet most rewarding in every level that, 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 we, yes. that we're lucky to live around. So, And you would have thought that the pandemic would have created that opportunity, right? That you, that you suddenly have more time to yourself. But again, we don't tend to do what you're suggesting. We tend to pack more in as opposed to use the time to contemplate our existence. So what happened instead uh, is in most families, they suddenly had to deal with homeschooling. Yep. So they had children at home 24 seven, right? And so keeping those children active, keeping them in, you know, uh, online, doing their homework, so on and so forth, that sort of raced in to take the place. And then there was, I've got to set up so that I can work remotely, right? And so there were a lot of things that sort of, uh, you know, like, uh, like water moved in to fill up the uh, vacant space. Remember that in nature uh, and in the natural world, there are no natural vacuums. You create a vacuum, it sucks something in right? It, it's going to draw something in. And what it seems to draw in is when activity is taken out, we draw in more activity, yeah. right? We, we get even more active. Now, I want to talk positively for a moment and say that there maybe, maybe wasn't the shift you're talking about where people said, wow, I don't have to go to work. You know, I have more time. I'm in more control. I'm going to go take walks in nature. I'm going to uh, really think about my life. Maybe it didn't happen the way that you perceive it, but something happened. Something happened because we now see this wave of what they're calling the great resignation, where people are not going back to work. And so something did occur. It may not have been the walks in nature and sitting down and meditating for hours on end like priests and monks do. I mean, it, it, that might not have been the path, but it's clear that there was sort of an awakening, an awakening that my life is not about earning. All I cannot dedicate 99.9% .9 of my life to existing, to earning, to being able to pay rent and have a car to drive. And so it wasn't this huge epiphany where everyone said, what am I doing with my life? It, it didn't happen that way, but something happened because people are not returning to work. They're not. And at least the proje projections right now at least 30% or more of the jobs will not have to be done remotely. The number one demand right now by uh, people seeking work is I think it's sevenfold, I believe the statistic was, it, it, if you have a job that can be done at home or remotely, you receive seven times the number of applicants than a job where you have to actually get in your car and go somewhere. Yeah. But equally, do Rebecca, and I don't, I don't know what it was, but one of the common ones I didn't, it was, it was, you know, I heard it a lot, was when all that traffic was just taken away, when all the, 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 the hubbub and bubble of this, 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 this thing we call life, it's, it's just slowed down a bit for whatever reason. People did, I mean, I heard it all the time, people were like, wow, I didn't realize there's that many birds in the sky. I didn't realize that they would, they would, sit, that they would start singing at seven, you know, five in the morning because all the extra noise, the monster to that noise. And I think that has been, like you said, it's not like some, you know, oh, I've got the moment, oh, it's all enlightenment. But people, like you said, it's that awakening to like, yeah, all, the, all this world we've constructed around us, nature is always there. It's going to, you know, it's going to outlive us. Nature's nature. It's a, it's a, it's a very strong thing. And, and an appreciation that I, I do think it's been, like you said, people have seen that one way or the other. They've, they've been almost 
it's been put in their face by the lack of noise and all that taken away from them. They're, it's this area like almost like a technicolor film compared to black and white. Like wow, we still exist in nature. The birds are, are there. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of a city centre or in the middle of you know the countryside. But you know nature will find it into every nook and cranny it can it can possibly. Find. That's right. It may have been something as simple as a mother who used to drop her kids off at school. And the school had two or three recess periods and a lunch period, right, scheduled for the kids at the school. But now the mother is at home or the father is at home with the children and now needs to create a recess. So maybe they went to the park with their children and just sat and listened to the birds, looked at the trees, right? And, and, and maybe at lunchtime they took a walk together right just to get your kids outside maybe it was very small things that added together made people feel as though i don't think i want to change that i do think i want to go to the park i do think i want to take that walk i think I'm, i might look for a job where i can be at home yeah and i have the freedom to to do those things but whatever it was, and people will analyze this, there is a great resignation going on, not just in the United States, but throughout Europe, there are a number of people that are not returning to their jobs. They're looking for some other way to be able to work and live that is more compatible. The pendulum swung too far the other way. Yeah. And I can say this because Americans work more hours and sacrifice more of their vacation than any other uh, advanced uh, industrial country. I mean, you look at it and the average American doesn't use their vacation. <laughs> uh, exactly. <laughs> they don't use their vacation, their paid vacation, I should say. Yeah. They don't use it for fear that someone will get ahead of them or yeah. they'll come back and they, you know, they will have missed something. Uh, whatever, but they, they they don't even use it. And so we're so overworked and we're so consumed by uh, economic ambition that we've kind of gotten away from what this biological spacesuit needs and requires to be happy. Now, anybody who's looked at the scientific research on happiness knows that there are certain requirements that if you don't hit those, your odds, your probability of feeling happy and meaningful are very low. Some of those are having someone that you can turn to in times of trouble that lives within a mile of you. If you don't have that, statistics go down that you're happy, right? Yeah. Having three to four close relationships that they don't have to be within a mile, but you have to have three or four. Yeah. You got one, go find two more. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, having in the United States an income of $250,000 a year, every dollar above $250,000 a year returns less in terms of your happiness. It's less and less and less. So. You know, yeah, go ahead and race to 250, but over and above that, it's not going, it, it, you might get a better car, you might be able to buy a boat and send your kids to a better school, but it's not going to have an incremental gain in your happiness. There are things like that that we have studied over the entire length of a person's uh, uh, existence. We've now studied this for over 70 years. And we now know what these things are. And of course, one of them, which is really big, is any time you spend in nature mm -hmm. is a plus. Any time. Back to your point. A walk in the park, a walk outside, listening to the birds, putting up a hummingbird feeder outside your kitchen window. You know, whatever it is you can do to be to bring nature closer to you is a plus. Yeah, because that's one of the things that it's going to be, again, fascinating when we, when we start to look back at this in a few years' time, in a decade's time, of like the people that are affected by the pandemic that lived in the cities compared to those who lived in the middle of, uh, you know, I don't know, the great, a Grand Savannah or something in Africa. Because it's like, in, in essence, their life 
you know, they, they, they've, they've lived within that, 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 that realm anyway. So it's kind of like, oh no, I haven't got internet connection. Well, I didn't have internet connection before I had that. Oh no, you know. So it's been an interesting one when we start to look back because I do think that, like you said, the pendulum swung too much the other way, like you said, where it became atomized and we became almost boxed into all these times and, you know, when we had to do this. And, and in essence, we're still, like you said, we're still human beings living on this rock that's tumbling through space. As, you know, the, like you said before, the, the technology may, may have expanded, but we're still, we still got this, you know, this biological machine. That's, we're not that different from people who lived on the planet 500 years ago. Our language may have changed, our sensibility. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't changed, but our, our biological space it hasn't changed a lot in 10,000 years. It still wants what it wants. It still needs what it needs. It's not as though in the next 10 years, we won't need oxygen, <laughs> right? It, I, I you know, uh, I have a friend of mine who lives nearby. He's a bit of a survivalist and he buys a lot of gold and silver, right? Uh, because he's pretty sure the economies are all going to collapse as a result of climate change. And I tell him, uh, he says, why aren't you buying more gold and silver? You know what's coming. And I said, because I, I'm going to get all your gold and silver. And he said, why is that? And I said, because you're going to turn it all over for a can of tuna fish. Exactly. Yeah. You see, I'm going to, all I'm going to have to do is wave a can of food, a can of beans in front of you, and you will give me all of that gold and silver. Because yeah. you can't eat gold and silver. You don't need gold and silver. But you do need food. Yeah. And 10,000 years from now, you're still going to need food. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm stocking canned goods <laughs> and <laughs> foods, soup, beans. Go ahead, stock all the gold and silver you want. I'll get all of it. So we, he, start, he, he laughed and he said, that's a good point. I said, I would stock oxygen if I could. <laughs> if I could stock enough of it. So your, your needs your needs for comfort, your needs for love, mm -hmm. your needs to feel pleasure, whether it's sex, whether it's looking at a beautiful painting, listening to music, admiring architecture, walking in nature, your need for nature, your need, you know, these are needs that have not changed for 10,000 years. They're not going to change anytime in the future. We got so far away from that, right? We built an economy where you never have to meet, talk to, or deal with another human being. I can have everything shipped to your house. Mm -hmm. You can see a doctor online, right? You never need leave. You never need bond with anyone, right? We, we live in an, an economy where kids are growing up and their quote friends are Facebook friends. People they, they, they all over the world, they will never meet. Yep. Never touch, never hug, right? So we've built this sort of environment that is inconsistent with who we've been for 10,000 years. And we wonder why we're having difficulty adjusting. On the positive side, we were talking about AI. The interesting thing about artificial intelligence is it has looked at us as a species and said, I realize you're doing all these things, by yourself alone. However, I've, we've looked at how the happiest people on the planet have been living for the past 70 and 80 years. And by the way, here are the common denominators. Remember how I was saying it looks for patterns? So to this extent, we need not fear AI. AI gives us clues insights even into our own behavior and our own societies it says you know what i realize that you you guys are doing this but actually the happiest people have someone they can turn to in times of trouble within one mile of their home two to three strong relationships income uh, at, at least two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year every dollar over and above that not going to add to your happiness you know uh they're they tend to be married mm -hmm. married people tend to be happier than single people sorry <laughs> so 
sorry. But that's what the data says, and that's what the patterns are. And so that's what AI uh, helps us. When you're when you're a scientist like me, I look at the data and say, isn't that interesting? You know, we always hear uh, 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 all of these single people saying, oh, I'm so glad I have no kids and no spouse and so on and so forth. And I said, but you know, statistically, actually, you're not as happy as a married person. Mm -hmm. People who have a strong spiritual base and are religious and practice spirit, some kind of spiritual practice, they tend to be happier than atheists. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, this is what the data says. We can say, well, I don't agree with that. Yeah, well, then you're not agreeing with the data. But, but this is all AI. AI isn't telling you you should be an atheist or you should go find a religion. <laughs> AI isn't telling you what to do. It's just saying, hey, there's a pattern here. Yeah. And if you want to know what makes people fulfilled, happy, you uh, amongst you very unique human species, we've kind of looked at the data and we now know. Yeah, and it's, I think that's the that's the real value. It is, and I think where where this crossover crossover in, in many ways to um, how so how we in the, again generally in the West, you know, you're talking about robots and how maybe like in some like Japan they view robots. Now they've got, now I know you discussed them on your latest show. You know, they've got robots that are in houses now and how you know. And living in, with living with older people and stuff, and I think one of the re the things that I've always thought about, the, the, particularly the Japanese and that kind of Western versus Eastern philosophy, is that the Japanese are very much based on the Shinto, which is the idea that it doesn't matter whether human spirit, is, you know, the, the consciousness or whatever, it can be in a rock, in a beautiful place, it can be in a in an animal, it can be in oh a robot, and that's why they kind of almost got this non-fear that we over here I mean, I often thought if I went to Japan I was thinking why are you fearful of it it's just another entity growing up amongst us and that makes and instead of seeing it as a fearful thing and they're going to take us over like you said it's actually no this is just going to correct us just like you went back 500 years ago and said oh we've got this thing called um the steam engine it's going to help you instead of you lumbering the things over on, the, on your back it's going to get that so we, we should never fear technology because I think, like you said, we're at that point where AI is just going to say to us, "Look, all those things you've you've not neglected, I'm here to look after." And uh, don't be fearful of it, but like I say, embrace it with I don't know, with some courage and, and love, and I think about, about an optimistic future rather than a dystopic future that can so easily be sort of fed and preached and pumped at us from every every source. That's right. That's right. I, I I see no benefit in looking at the dystopic future because. It's not likely, statistically it's not likely, and because our numbers are so large and because we have so much science and technology to, to, to uh, defend against that, that probability. Um, you mentioned Japan, I lived in Japan for 16 years. And, and in Japan, as you point out, everything is alive. Yeah. Everything is alive. Everything has a spirit. Everything is alive, which is why J Japan was way ahead of the Western world in terms of animation. Animation was just another form of bringing technology alive, right? Uh, and uh, avatars, those are alive, right? And robots are alive. Thoughts, ideas, art, all alive. E everything is part of the living world. There's not a separation between things that are biologically alive and things that are inanimate. There really isn't. Everything is alive. Everything is, is part of the living world. And so their, their attitude toward robots is quite different than the Western world. I was talking to a friend of mine not long ago who checked into a robot hotel. And he's a leading technologist. I won't mention his name. But he's a leading technologist. I mean, he's he's right on the cutting edge of everything that's going on. And he said, it freaked me out. <laughs> he said, I, I got to the I got to the check-in count check-in counter and there were these robots and they said, Hello, uh, may I have your name? And they and they it did they it was not like they had to look at a computer. They knew who he was, they knew what kind of room he was. They said, very, very good. If you'll hand me your phone, I'll, I'll give you your key. 
Uh, your room is on the seventh floor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, GPS will guide you to your room and, and all of that. Please have a, a wonderful time. And when he came down the next morning, they said, hello, Mr. Blah, blah, blah. How was your night stay? So on and so forth. You have an appointment at 10 o'clock. Right, your appointment calendar reminded us to tell you that it, you know you have an appointment at ten o'clock. He's the interesting thing about these robots in these robot hotels is that they never forget what you look like. They will never forget your name. They will never forget your children's name. They will never forget the last. And a thousand years from now, you could check into that hotel, mm -hmm. and they will remember. They they do what they they never forget. Never forget. And so imagine and being an elderly person who can't leave your home and you have a social robot that is your companion that helps you with your shopping and helps you get dressed, helps you bathe, right? Never complains, never takes a day off. And you can tell stories to and it walks over and says, oh, by the way, don't forget your granddaughter's birthday's coming up. Should we go shop for a gift? Yeah. And never forgets that. Never forgets the funny story about the pony you bought your granddaughter, right? Never, t never forgets a story. Never forgets a person. Never forgets you. And and imagine how integral to your life it, that will be, right? Never mind that it can lift you if you fall. It can call for help. It can put you in a self-driving car and get you to the hospital. J just you know, imagine all of that. So in the, in the East, and, and in Japan in particular, robots are everywhere. There are entire hotels that have no human beings. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to, I'm going back to Japan next year, and I, I can't wait to, I'm, go, I'm deliberately going into an all-robot all hotel, because I want to see my own human reaction to that. Yeah, exactly. And this, this is this is the other level. We, we are. I, I, I tell so many people that it almost becomes a cliche. But we, these are the greatest days to be living in. We're we're, we're fortunate. We're, we're seeing this. Around. If you fast forward X amount of years, it's like it's like a, or it's like I always say. It's like imagine going back. Um, I don't know, 150 years ago, and you you thinking, oh, I know what's coming. Television's right coming. Radio's coming. Electronics is coming. And you, if you would. Be like that's that's the period I just love to sit and experience. We're in that now. I don't think people really understand and appreciate that the the magnitude of what we're going through right now. It's very exciting, but you know, again, these this biological spacesuit. I just want to remind everybody, it's natural reaction. The sympathetic nervous system when it encounters something that it doesn't know immediately goes into fight or flight. It goes into a fear mode. We're designed to be afraid of things we don't know. That's, that's unfortunate because progress means encountering things we don't understand and we don't know at an accelerating rate. Things we don't understand and we don't know are coming at us every day. You yeah. know, every day I promise you there's a new insurance investment annuity vehicle or some new instrument on Wall Street that you can invest in that you've never heard of, don't understand, and are afraid. <laughs> you know, just give me a bond or give me a, an indexed fund, but don't, don't talk to me about credit default swaps. What the heck is that, right? So, um, so every day the world is getting more complicated. There's more vulnerability, right? People, older people are getting scammed every day on the phone, right? Uh, uh, an alleged government office calls up or they get an email that, that looks like Amazon that says, uh, you know, there's a problem with your account. Please type your account number in there so we can straighten it out. And so, dope dee do we type it in, right? It, sh it had the Amazon logo. All they had, somebody did was cut and paste it. Yeah. Right. So every day, you know, we, we we're dealing with this fear. I'm getting scammed. I don't understand. It's too complicated. I don't I don't know what medical insurance to buy. You know, they keep talking to me and I, I'm not a doctor. I don't know which one to buy. I, you know, the, the complexity has gotten so large that and so deep 
that that people feel confused and they feel worried and they feel worried about ai they feel worried about robots they feel worried about viruses you know what are we going to turn ourselves into a virologist and know whether i should take a vaccine or not take a vaccine you know i, I get overwhelmed with these questions because i am a scientist and they, and they go well should i or shouldn't i and i say i'm not a virologist <laughs> I'm a sociobiologist. Your opinion's as good as mine. You know, so my point is, is that we're a bit overwhelmed and we're not adapting as quickly as progress uh, moves forward. So in a case like that, it's exciting, but it's really important to realize what you need and needed for the past 10,000 years. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's very important to take stock at a baseline and say, I've evolved this modern human being, but my body, my biology, my brain, my emotions, my sympathetic nervous system is still the same as 10,000 years ago. Yeah. And when I see something I don't understand, I go into a fear reaction and I will either get paralyzed, I will fight, or I will run, mm. right? And as soon as you know that about yourself, you can check in with yourself. And one of the tricks I use, and I'd like to share this with everyone, one of the tricks I learned from a friend of mine who's a psychologist is when I encounter something new, I start a sentence with this. Isn't it interesting that I and then fill in the blank, fill in the blank. So I, I say to myself, isn't it interesting that I'm really a, a feeling anxious about this? Yeah. Or, or I say, isn't it interesting that I don't like this? Well, why don't I like it? I've never seen this before. I've never heard of this before. Why don't I like it? Yeah. I, 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 there's no reason. And then and, and that kind of somehow connects me connects me you know uh when i go it, well isn't it interesting i'd rather sit in front of my computer than go take a walk <sighs> you know like what what's going on there and that just somehow just starting the sentence that way just connects me it it it, it reconnects me to that ten thousand year old <laughs> biological spacesuit right and we all need some kind of shortcut to get there i think no that's that's that's, that's very insightful and i think that's, that's a great little uh, one to remember i like, I like that that's very because it's, it's it's dealing with that humility again it's like it's great this is enjoy the ride that's all we can say enjoy enjoy this yes, ride. And, and it's acknowledging how you feel yeah it's it's not denying how you feel you know i i recently met uh a person that my friend is dating and I, I had a very negative reaction to him you know uh, uh, we met far apart <laughs> because of COVID uh, but I don't know if he was nervous but I felt he was trying to sell me on what a great person he was and uh, that doesn't really go over very well with me being a scientist uh, in general but but I, I remember looking at him and saying to myself, not out loud, thankfully, uh, but I, I remember saying to myself, isn't it interesting I don't trust him? Mm. Isn't it interesting? I don't know anything about his background. I don't know anything about his work. I, I'm just getting to know him. But isn't it interesting that I don't trust him? And I thought about this for a while and I remembered that in the earlier times that I had talked about when there were only a few thousand of us human beings that were on the entire earth and it wasn't likely our species was gonna make it. When we encountered an animal we hadn't seen before or another human that we hadn't seen before, we had a choice. Yeah. We had a choice, kill them or run. And there is, there are uh, anthropologists that believe since we came out of these uh, a few tribes, maybe six or eight tribes that we all originated from, 
that there is something in our DNA that when we encounter somebody who was from a tribe that tried to kill us, that was from a warring tribe, that our DNA remembers, that our bodies remember, and that we react immediately negatively, yeah. right? And, and I don't know, you know, this has never been proven or researched, but the way that I responded to him, I thought to myself, I wonder if he was from a tribe that tried to kill us. <laughs> 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 and, and, and it's and it's helped me because I'm nicer to him and I you know I'm able to say yes I had this reaction this response it's not rational it's 10,000 years old and uh, get over it mm -hmm. and listen to him ask yeah. some questions get some information yeah yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly correct there, Rebecca. So on, on the sort of like last two years, I mean, and kind of like sort of really, are, you know, where you are right now, have you got any plans to write any more new books or what, what's your sort of time? I mean, other than doing what you're doing, but it's, it's really... Sort well, of you know, I started, I started a podcast yeah. uh, and people can go to my website, which is my name, RebeccaCosta.com to, to get the podcast. I started a podcast with some of the world experts on health care, on finance, on uh, uh, environmental studies. I, I, I was so connected to so many brilliant people, including, uh, you know, one of the leading experts on climate change. And I thought it would be interesting for all of us to get together and do this uh, podcast. So I have that going on and I am starting on a new book. Um, and I, I hope it'll be out uh, probably next year. Right. Yeah, and, and the new book is really tying in a lot of the problems that we face today, a lot of the challenges we face today to exactly what we've been talking about, which is they have to do with a 10,000 year old biological spacesuit that we're trapped in. Yeah. And when you look at why we are growing more obese, why suicide rates are going up, why we continue to engage in war, right? Why, why we, uh, you know, why we continue to uh, see mass violence go up. When you look at all of those things, they all have a biological impetus. They are all tied to this, this programming that is in this 10,000 year old spacesuit that's out of step with modern society, right? We, we have progressed beyond our 10,000 year old uh, space suit. And so what to do about that? There's a gap between biologically how we are programmed to behave, what we want, and, uh, and, and how we act and decide, and society, that uh, how fast we've progressed. There's a gap. And that gap really is preventing us from acting on a lot of things in a in a uh, more in a different way I, I believe the solutions to the problems whether it's addiction or whether it's mass murder are dramatically different from uh from the way that we've been treating them as economic or legislative problems i don't believe they're law enforcement i don't believe they're legislative and i don't believe they're economic driven i believe they're biologically driven yeah yeah well i, I look forward to uh when that that comes out and again like you said people can go and find you just, just type in rebecca you know you'll find you'll find her podcast it's, it's a very I, it's, I i love it i i i it's um one of the things i love about your podcast rebecca is, is the fact you, you do and again i think it's important that you 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 Especially as you're talking to some of the most, you know, some erudite people that they, they, they know their knowledge of their field completely well. You're talking very high level stuff. You interact that with music, and I think that's that's what I love about your thing. You, you, yeah. it's, it's separation because I think we need to. And I've said it for a long time. Is we need to reconnect the arts and science and 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 and, and spirituality, and all needs to be connected rather than stuck away and like, oh no, you're over here and you're over here. And my, this is my field. And I love the way you don't do that in the show. I love the way you sometimes stop and then you know, have a break and talk about music. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's that's beautiful. That's really just from my. Oh own yes, in the, in the podcast, uh, Mike Hagen is our music curator, and he 
find these very interesting artists from all over the world. And I just, I learned so much from that part of it, let alone the segments, the climate segments, the technology exactly. segments, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really fun. It's really fun. And, you know, we should never think of the arts as something different. It's, it's not different. It's just part of being human. And in fact, uh, Ed Wilson pointed out, it may be the most unique thing about being human. Yeah. Well, before we do wrap this up, um, Rebecca, thank you very much for giving me your time. I know how precious and how busy you are, and let alone on this, like, that we've been discussing tonight. There's so much in life going on, it's so time. So thank you from all my heart for giving me the time. But before we do wrap this up, I'm going to leave you with a final word. Well, I would say uh, we're not facing a dystopic future. You know, there's so much, uh, there's so much to look forward to and so much about being a human being that is enjoyable and positive. And, and I know that people are, uh, you know, they, they look at the news and they many times, uh, you know, just shake their heads and feel that we're just going down a wrong path. But we, we are very resilient. We have proven over millions of years to be the most resilient species. So that ought to tell us something. Beautiful. Well, with that, I would say life is people, people. Well, they say that life is people and that people are angels and that angels are devils and the devils are me and you.